Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike Young, your host, and this is the first part of our interview with Brian Sunshine Sinclair. In this episode, he chats about his time flying the S3B Viking, which includes his training, what it was like to handle, the aircraft's role, and also some very interesting stories at the end. I also want to thank our sponsor, Laco Watches, who were one of the original companies to produce pilot watches for the Luftwaffe during World War II. They produce both A and B dial watches in different sizes to suit all tastes, which adopt the look of times gone by but still satisfied modern demands. You can check out all their models and products via www.laco.de. Thank you. So, Sunshine, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, so actually, Mike, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate that. And uh, back when I was eight, I got a book called Visions of the Universe, a series of illustrations about basically our solar system. And uh, some, it had some text written by Isaac Asimov from my uncle. I got the book from my aunt and uncle. And it just kind of energized me. And I really uh, loved space. And I wanted to be an astronaut. And I felt that a natural stepping stone to be an astronaut was to be a pilot. Wow. So what year did you join the U.S. Navy? Uh, I was sworn in, if you will, July 1st of 1993. It was a, a, a rude awakening, I would say, definitely culture shock. Yeah, so uh, in high school, that's when I was making my decision because I applied to all three of our service, big service academies. That would be West Point for Army, Air Force, obviously, and Navy. I was blessed enough to be able to get into all three, and then I had my options. Uh, from there, listening to my parents, uh, my mom actually, so I grew up in Pennsylvania. The Naval Academy is in Maryland, so the adjacent state, if you will. So she really enjoyed the proximity. She also really enjoyed the uniforms, believe it or not, the Navy uniforms <laughs> over the Air Force uniforms, yeah. Yeah. So um, those were some of the deciding factors. But then, honestly, I did my research, and I thought, well, hey, I want to be an astronaut. Which of the three major academies has the, the, the most amount of astronaut graduates? And at the time, it turned out to be the Naval Academy. So between my uh, research and wanting to be an astronaut and also my mom's druthers, as I would call them, uh, I chose Navy. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about some of the aircraft you started uh, your basic training on. What were they like and what did you actually train on? Yeah. So uh, I went through the Naval Academy, didn't fly anything. I had one flight in a Cessna, just a civilian uh, Cessna 172. It was very low threat, low stress. And then I stepped into flight school. And the first plane that we trained on was the T-34C Turbo Mentor. Ah, yes. Are you, you familiar with that? Yes, I am, yeah. I got Yeah, I got the little beast right here, right? So anyway, just this little guy. So it's a low wing, as you can see. It's a turboprop. Uh, my life was pretty much going about maximum speed of 280 knots. So it wasn't really uh, – but going from car speed, trying to accelerate my, my thinking processes up to 280 knots is, is a big deal. So it was a nice gradual progression. I finished up primary training, as we call it, in VT-28 down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And from there, I headed off to Kingsville, Texas, and I flew the T-45C. Mm -hmm. So the T-45, it's a little slick, a little more slick jet. I got a quick demo. I'm sure your folks at home have seen this before. But anyway, one oh, of these we guys. We call it the Hawk. Exactly. Yeah, and we call it the Goss Hawk. Yeah, and we could, I'm sure we could ruminate on that for, <laughs> for eons, for oh, ages. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll talk about this. But so we took your slick trainer, if you will, or your slick jet, excuse me, and then, uh, as in cool jet, what I mean by that slick, and then we uh, turned it into our trainer. So it's a non after burning trainer for us. And my life went from max speed of about 280 knots to almost 550, 560 knots. So not quite double, but pretty darn close. So That's it was a big a, difference, isn't it? It's, it's a very big difference, man. And, uh, one of the keys for me throughout flight school was they, they give us this mantra that we call it. So it's aviate, navigate and communicate. And to be able to balance and juggle and really prioritize all three of those successfully takes a lot of work. So imagine being a college student going from 60 to maybe 70, 80 miles an hour for me. And then from there jumping into 280 and then from there jumping into 550. So uh, it was it was a, a steep, I would call it, learning curve, but very enjoyable. So after your basic flight training, uh, where did you get posted to and what aircraft did you actually want to go on to on the frontline squadrons? So uh, I am a product of the Top Gun era here in the United States. So as I went through the Naval Academy and flight school, I really wanted to fly the F-14. That opportunity, unfortunately, did not present itself. So I, selected, I was selected for S-3s. Mm -hmm. So S-3s, I'll be honest with you, when I got the word, I didn't know what it was, and back there in 98, 
I'd, uh, we didn't have Google and all that stuff. Information wasn't as easy to get, so the internet wasn't as big. So I actually had to ask around, like, uh, what is an S3? Where will oh, I be really? and all that stuff? Yeah, and I had never been to San Diego. So when I, uh, I'm going from Kingsville, Texas, which is kind of kind of sparse, I would say, at best. It's a lot of uh, desertish areas. And then someone said, oh, you're going to San Diego. And growing up in Pennsylvania, I had barely been to California. I went to school in Maryland. Didn't make it that far west, really. So when I found out I was going to San Diego and flying this plane I'd never heard of before, actually, my folks came in for graduation. And we went up to Houston, which is not too far from Kingsville, where I did my training. And I, uh, I bought a convertible Corvette to try to um, <laughs> console myself, I guess you can say. Yeah. So, so one of my first ever experiences of entering into the S3 community was actually driving my convertible Corvette from Texas to California, which was fun. Uh, so I'll be honest with you, it's a step down in performance. So mm -hmm. in the T45, we can pull a whole lot of Gs. We can go, as we said earlier, about 550, 560 knots. The S3, though, is going to be limited to, it's, it, it wasn't designed for that. So, you know, it's, it's a good design for its an original intent, and I can't complain about that. But we're looking at limited 450 and about 3.5 Gs. And we used to, and the thing has windshield wipers. So <laughs> I don't know if any other carrier-based uh, jets will say that have windshield wipers. So I was like, okay, so it's kind of slow. It's kind of big. And honestly, we used to joke that the uh, tinted canopies or so that your friends couldn't see you flying the jet. So <laughs> good or bad, that's what we said. But um, in all in all honesty, just like pretty much every naval aviator, you grow to learn, or excuse me, you grow to love your aircraft. So I really grew into it, and I, I realized what it was designed for, and I enjoyed, most importantly, the people that were part of the community. So the jet is one thing, and it was kind of a step down from a T-45 or hoping to fly the F-14, but what I realized is, A, I now had orders to live in San Diego, I had no idea how fantastic San Diego was until I drove, no kidding, across the Coronado Bridge, top down in my convertible Corvette, wow. and I thought, wow, yeah, that's where I'm going to train, and that's where I'm going to live. So, that's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> dude, it was, it's, it's one of those things that I wasn't wise enough or mature enough to know all the different aspects of what I'll call quality of life, right? For me, you know, I was trained, I was focused on single-seat fighters, single-seat fighters, go, you know, knife in your teeth, get out there, drop bombs. And then I realized, oh, wait, you can have a fantastic quality of life, have less stress, and be around some fantastic people. So I, that's the way I learned is by joining the S3 training squadron. Let's talk about the S3's role. What was it actually designed for? Yeah, so back in the 50s, the Navy was looking for a follow-on to the S2 tracker. It's an anti-submarine. And right about that time, the Russians had gone, you know, uh, at the time, they were the, the big capital threat, we'll call them. But they had gone from their diesel submarine technology to their nuclear submarine technology, or it was emerging, we'll say. So what we needed is some kind of a anti-submarine warfare aircraft that had long range and also long lawyer times or max endurance, as we would call it. So Lockheed was looking for uh, looking at designs, if you will. But Lockheed at the time, they weren't terribly good with or very mature with carrier-based designs. Yeah, yeah. So they... Right. So like folding, when I say carry based designs, I'm talking beefed up landing gear, beefed up structures to uh, endure the traps, if you will, a reinforced hook, uh, folding wings, folding tails and all that stuff. So the, the basic general requirements to operate on the carrier. Anyway, they were not good at that stuff yet. So they brought in the uh, LTV, which is a Ling Temco Vought. They LTV, they uh, they built the A7s. They're known for the A7 Corsair. So Lockheed said, hey, guys, can you help us out kind of uh, with how to design this stuff? And they got a lot of Good info, obviously, from them. And then right about, I think it was 68, uh, check my notes here, sorry, 69, the S, the YS3 Lockheed design was chosen. And then at that point, they went into uh, further refinement and manufacturing. And what we call the IOC, so the initial operational capability, happened in 1974, which coincidentally was the same year that I IOC. So I was born in 74. Yeah, they, and they only built them from 74 to 78. I think there's like 186 of them or so. But um, so it was anti-submarine warfare. This is a very long, sorry, test pilot answer to your shorter question. But uh, <laughs> so pardon me for that. But um, uh, yeah, so it was anti-submarine warfare. It replaced the S2, right, looking for subs. So we're talking about Sona boys. We're talking about long range endurance. Uh, it's got a magnetic anomaly detector. It's kind of a stinger comes out the back and looks for any kind of magnetic anomalies. Uh, it also has a real nice radar suite, the APS-137, which is inverse synthetic aperture radar. If you guys, I don't know if your listeners have 
talked about that, but something to Google. You can save that for another day. But uh, what it boils down to is you could actually find things that are about the size of a periscope at quite a distance. Wow. So, yeah, so it's pretty impressive, the radar. It's actually very impressive. And at the time, you know, nowadays with our fifth generation fighters, they talk about sensor fusion. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the first instances of sensor fusion was actually with the S3, with its radar and its uh, ESM suite, the uh, EW suite, if you want to call it. So that'd be the ALR. I think it's 67 or maybe 76, but basically the radar receivers, the radar itself, the magnetic anomaly detector in the back, and all that data could be fused together to provide a, a very clear picture of what's going on. Wow, so like quite an impressive aircraft for its time. It, it really was, you know what I'm saying? It was, uh, and it, it turned out to stay impressive. And what I mean by that is, as the, the mission kind of, I wouldn't say lingered, but it transferred more to the helicopters. They said, well, what can we do with this thing? Because it's a very reliable airframe. So they end up using it for utility purposes. So they could transport gear in it, they could put people in it. And then eventually it became pretty much in just an aerial refueler. So what I mean by, I say just, is it not as sexy as the Hornets and the, the Tomcats dropping bombs, shooting missiles, but very essential, especially around the carrier for what we call blue water ops. Okay. I don't know, are you, are, you, are you and the listeners pretty um, aware of blue water ops? Oh yeah, we have a lot of Navy fans on our channel, so yeah, they'll know. Okay, cool. You get, yeah. So it's, I mean, the carrier can't be blue water without some kind of recovery tanker, right? And, and the S3 was... Sorry, the S3 at the time was the only show in town. Yeah. So let's talk about some of like your ground training on the S3. What was it like coming from, like you say, like a, you know, a fast jet like the Goshawk? Uh, how, how, how did you feel about this? Uh, actually, once I got over my little ego thing, it was, uh, <laughs> it was actually really nice. I, I had never worked with a guy before in the cockpit. The training for us, they focus on single seat where you're supposed to do all three of those, aviate, navigate, and communicate. And... When you get another guy in the cockpit, it at first was kind of awkward. So not awkward like a high school dance or anything like that, but just, you know, you don't want to step on his toes. He doesn't want to step on yours. And are the responsibilities and the roles clearly defined? And then once you establish those roles, and they're kind of codified through the community. So it's not like, hey, this, this naval flight officer, the NFO, he works this way and this other NFO works this way. It was very standardized, which was nice. So once the pilots as a whole understood how the NFOs work, you could integrate. And no kidding, two heads are almost always better than one. So uh, let's talk about your first flight in the S3. What was that like? Uh, well, because I had come from T-45 land where things were faster, it was actually very enjoyable, not only for the speed, so my brain was kind of already trained for those speeds on how to anticipate the aircraft, but also the scenery, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't know if you've had a chance to be in San Diego, but it's, uh, it's pretty nice on the, from the ground eye view. And then when you're up at 3,000 to 5,000 feet, it's even so better. Much better. <laughs> yeah, it is. So I just really enjoyed it. The other thing that was new to me is, uh, as you can picture the S3, it's got the two engines that hang off the wings. Yes. And we started learning about single engine operations. So, uh, so if you can think of a one engine gets, we didn't shut it off, but we put it at idle. And we flew around, there's a yaw that's created, right? So basically a twisting motion. Mm -hmm. Sorry to use my hands there. And uh, so... I had never dealt with anything other than centerline thrust before. So there was some good learning, and it wasn't difficult. It definitely had a high wing loading and, and um, plenty of power available for what it needed. So mm. it was easy to adjust, but it was, it was, there was some learning there. Right. It looks very much like an airliner. Yeah, do you mind if I go grab the... Uh, yeah, absolutely. The go <laughs> grab it, sunshine. <laughs> Sorry to put my back to the audience. <laughs> but anyway, so... Yeah, so... Uh, you're absolutely right. You got the low slung engine. So here's the, uh, this is a wooden model of the S3B. And what squadron is this in, before uh, we uh, move on? So that one is VS-41, VS which is 41. the yeah. fleet replacement or fleet replenishment squadron, excuse me, FRS, or as the old timers call it, the RAG, replacement air group. Yeah. And so just like you said, it's got the low slung engines, right? And when I say low slung, I mean it comes off the wing, but it also is actually below the center of gravity. So that becomes an issue... Uh, when you add power, the jet has a natural, not a very dramatic, but has a natural tendency to pitch up. So that, that, and we can talk about it later, but I actually had binding controls one time where my, my, uh, elevator authority or pitch authority didn't work. So I had to use the throttles to pitch the nose up and then retard the throttles to bring the nose back down. So, wow. um, okay. So it was built, as we mentioned earlier for loitering, right? So yep. it had plenty of gas. Gas was never a factor. It was uh, very 
low stress when it came to fuel management. I'll say that. So that's a definite plus. It, uh, it flew around slowly, which is good for surveillance, but also it, that's huge for when you're coming back aboard the carrier. Yeah. So as we, as we mentioned earlier, it's got the, the big wings and the light weight. So we're going to call it low wing loading. So low wing loading is going to lend itself to a slow approach speed, which I absolutely enjoyed. Uh, the other thing, one thing we did mention was uh, with the slow approach speed, one of the design features is called direct lift control DLC. So it has these, there's a button on the stick and it pops up spoilers on the top of the wing and, and spoils the lift and you can come down real quickly. So you got these engines that can kind of pop you up real quickly and then you got a button to drop you back down. So it turns out to be very, I thought, very forgiving to land on the carrier. Uh, so the S3 doesn't have the heads up display yeah. as you, you and your folks there are probably familiar. So uh, whereas the Hornet guys, and I became a Hornet guy, so I can kind of I can kind of poke the bear a little bit on this one. <laughs> but, but the Hornet guys traditionally would declare an emergency for a no HUD approach. Well, the S3, we never had a HUD. So um, so it was very dark and it was no kidding. The LSO, the landing signal officer basics that we were taught in flight school, that is meatball lineup angle of attack. Uh, it's a very forgiving airframe, except uh, for two instances. One is going to be when you add power, the nose does pitch up. So you're going to have to counter it by pushing ever so slightly forward on the stick. So your, your two hands, I'm sorry, your hands, excuse me, have to work even harder, I thought, or more together. And then if you look at this beast, so this thing is about, well, it, it's short, right? You can see it's kind of short. That was due to some carrier specifications. I'm going to throw out a number. I think it was 59 feet or something. I'm sorry, I forget. But basically, because of that, there was a lot of uh, lateral instability. So they had to build this big old tail. So that's kind of one of the characteristics of this big old tail. Well, because of that big old tail and the way the wings are placed, we had something called Dutch roll. So uh, yes, are you, yes. you know Dutch roll? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the way I think of it, and we had a flight control, we had computers on board that would uh, counteract or accommodate, we'll say the Dutch roll. But if the computers didn't work, which happened on occasion, then the yaw dampener, as it was called, I felt no kidding like Stevie Wonder coming down the chute. <laughs> and I was, it was totally, I just called to say I love you, that I hate this. <laughs> so, so, Great turn, yeah. Was, yeah, but anyway, so, so what I'm getting at is landing at night on the carrier, it's just as dark as you think. And honestly, I didn't get paid to land enough at, land enough, I didn't get paid enough, excuse me, to land at night. But uh, I definitely would have landed on during the day for free, man. That was a lot of fun. Right, so it's it's community specific. So if you're not a pilot, but you're aircrew in the Navy, then you're a naval flight officer. Naval. But then once you get into your specific platform for a prowler, there you're an electronic countermeasures officer, ECMO. For oh, an F-18, okay. you're, yeah, for an F-18, you're a weapon system operator, so WISO, WSO. But my guys were just known as, uh, we had different positions called TACOs, but I'm going to leave that aside. And I'll tell you what, it, it got to the point, because you're flying with another guy that's your age, and you're out there, and the Navy really puts a lot of trust in us once we get our wings. So you're out there with this fancy machine, whether it be a Hornet or an S3, and we would go sometimes up in the S3, go up to about 400, 400 plus miles away from the carrier. And we did wow. something called long range patrols or LERPs or LRPs, and we were by ourselves. So it's just me and this other guy my age in kind of the, the station wagon, if you will, and we're, <laughs> we can't even talk to the carrier, we're so far away. And they just hoped that at a certain time we would be back overhead to land. So mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the interaction with my right seater. And the right seater had his own throttle and stick. So we could actually take turns. Uh, I would oh, never. Oh, the stick in the S3. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, uh, doctrine prevented the right seater from landing. So the right. pilot who sat in the left seat is in charge of the landing, both carrier and land based. Yeah, so out on the carrier, it's predominantly uh, sleep, eat, fly and then rinse and repeat. So we would, uh, as you can imagine, a pilot on an aircraft carrier doesn't have a lot to do except play video games, eat, sleep, and fly. So we absolutely loved it. So a day would traditionally start probably about eight o'clock in the morning. So it was kind of later because we'd usually stay up late for night operations. Yeah. So you start up at eight, uh, probably hit the gym, get some breakfast, get showered, get in your flight suit, then get breakfast, excuse me, then head down to the ready room. So. The ready room on the carrier is kind of the social mecca for the squadron, so it's everybody hangs out. So you'd hang out there. Now, the, the day prior, the flight schedule would have come out, so you would have already known what your flight was and when your flight was. So you'd, you'd get your administrative things done, whether it be building kneeboard cards, 
or uh, talking to your crew, make sure they know what's going on. Sometimes you'd have to talk to the intelligence officer on the carrier and um, uh, and figure out what's the, the lay of the land, if you will, so to speak. So you get all that done, you go for your flight, and the, the brief and the flight and the debrief were a majority of the day. And because we had a lot of gas, if you will, we could stay up for what we call cycles, so many intervals, we'll call it. So you stay up for a long time, and you come back down, and it's probably dinner at that point, go get something to eat, and then unwind in the ready room, and then uh, probably think about some people hit the gym then, and then probably go to sleep and start the day over. Wow, so like quite a busy day then. It was. On fly days, it was very busy. And believe it or not, no fly days could sometimes be, they were definitely more boring, but they could even be more busy because, or busier, excuse me, because that's when the uh, the leadership, the CEO and the XO would try to have all the meetings, yeah. try to get all the meetings done so you can get ready for the next fly day. Did air crew uh, get treated better on the ship than, you know, the kind of, I don't know, the guys who didn't fly. <laughs> that is a great question. I'm glad you asked. I have two words for you. Crew, rest. <laughs> so what I mean by that is the uh, we call them the surface warfare officers, the SWOs. So ship's company, they had watches and, they, you know, as the, whenever the ship's steaming or underway, they have to have some set of eyes, at least, you know, a couple guys looking around. So they didn't have the... Um, the sanctuary for rest that we did. So we had a mandatory rest period and that included actually sleeping. And so we had ours, they didn't have theirs. And uh, we may have heard about it once or twice. Yeah. So I think we got, all I'm going to say, nothing against the SWOs is that I love my job as a pilot on the aircraft carrier. And we were pretty much, you know, everyone was kind of supporting us to do our missions. But uh, did you ever do any DACT in the S3? Funny you ask. So DAC, yes, we did, absolutely. So the similar air uh, combat, right, training? Yep. Uh, so I did it against a Prowler, and I did it against an F-18. So a little background is uh, this would have been during the Operation Enduring Freedom, mm -hmm. and I was on the John F. Kennedy. We're in the North Arabian Sea, just south of Pakistan. And the Hornets would launch three aircraft to make two for a combat section to go in. The third, once the first two primary, if you will, were designated as mission ready and they'd launch and, and go into country, the third just got to hang out. So a lot of times, and keep in mind, these guys are going in what we call double ugly. So they'd have a fuel tank on the center line, fuel tank on one side, excuse me, on that side, they have a FLIR and all sorts of stuff hanging off the wings. The reason I mention that is they're very draggy. Yeah. So it's not the fantastic performance you're used to. It's, you know, got a lot of drag out there. So um, once or twice, I may have uh, tied, you know, mixed it up with a, an F-18. And our, now that's just a more maneuverable, more capable aircraft, obviously, the F-18 than S-3. But we had this little trick up our sleeve called maneuver flaps. Wow. So we would, yeah, we'd come into the merge, and I'd drop my maneuver flaps, and I'd get down really slow. And keep in mind, the S-3 stall speed was something around 97 knots. So it was less, really? it was double wow. Yeah, it's double digits, so it was way low, dude. And then I could actually just kind of turn inside of this, the Hornet who's turning around bigger circles. And I had, you know, I didn't have any way to pretend to shoot him or anything like that, but I just tried to stay behind him and until he went vertical or something like that. But uh, so, so we did it there. So in summary, because the F-18s were so heavily laden with all the air-to-ground stores, there was an opportunity for me, I wouldn't say to, to beat him, but to, to tie or break even. Now, the Prowler was different because uh, you can talk about aircraft capabilities, but one of the capabilities is honestly visibility, mm -hmm. right? So they, they teach us in training that you lose sight, you lose the fight. Well, the Prowler has extremely poor visibility once you pass the wing line or the 3-9, if you think oh, really? of it like a code. Yeah. Wow. So the, uh, now the S3 is similar, except if we have guys in the back, because it's, it's actually a four-seat aircraft, they can look out the window a little bit. So what you have is two, we used to call them the fat kids. So we had two fat kids out there that would uh, mix it up by turning and coming toward each other. But as soon as we passed each other's uh, wing lines, if you will, kind of like this, right about here, we started to lose sight. And you just had to turn and hope you knew where he ended up. So it turned out to be two fat, almost partially blind, we'll call them kids, fighting on the playground. And it was, it was never elegant or pretty, but it was fun. Do you have any memorable stories you can share with us on the S3? I do. Uh, the first one, 
Yeah, so a, a couple uh, funny ones and a couple scary ones. The first scary one I remember was uh, my job was to launch at night, and I had a buddy of mine from the academy flew the F-14, the plane on the fly, right? He, uh, he needed some flares dropped in the water so he could go do his bombing practice. So we joined up. It was, um, and he, I joined on him, and then he gave me the lead, and I, I, we headed out to the, the bombing area, if you will. This is from the carriers over water. It's about 6 o'clock in the evening, so up at 18,000 feet and above, it's still, it's still daylight, right? But now as we start to descend down, we kind of dive into the darkness or dive into the night. So here I have, imagine the plane that I've always wanted to fly is right next to me out the left side of, of the plane. So as I'm descending down, I'm looking like, man, that thing is so sweet. Man, that thing is so sweet, so sweet. I'm coming down. We get down to about 400 feet. I have certain altitude alarms that go off. I'm like, okay, I need to pay more attention to my instruments than the plane next to me. We're coming out. Well, what I had unfortunately done poorly that day was adjust the Colesman setting. So the, the Colesman window, excuse me, the altimeter setting on the, the barometric altimeter. So all of a sudden I heard a, an altitude warning from the aircraft, actually based on the radar altimeter, but I, my f- human factors, the first thing I looked at was the altitude gauge, the barometric altitude, and the needle, I will never forget, honestly, was winding down through 60 feet, which is the height of the flight deck, Yeah. and I was nose down at 250 knots or something like that coming downhill. So I actually, my whole body tensed, and when I tensed, I pulled back on the stick, but I thought... Is this going to hurt when I die? I, I kid you not, man. That's that's honestly what I thought. Is this going to hurt? And uh, fortunately, you know, uh, grace of God, I pulled hard enough that I was able to recover. And it turned out that the because I had incorrectly set the barometric altimeter, I was off by about 100 feet. Really? So my guess is when I saw 60 feet, I was really at 160 feet yeah, descending. Yeah. yeah. So I definitely uh, was reminded of the lesson of set the correct altimeter setting on deck. <laughs> So that, that was one kind of near-death scary thing. Um, another one was another scary thing in that um, – have have you and the listeners had a chance to talk about how we land on the carrier during the day? We do kind of a circular pattern to land? Yeah, yeah, you do the, the circuit, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So the carrier's off to my left. It's heading in the opposite direction than I am. So I'm at what we call the 180 – or the beam position. Mm-hmm. And I look over in the Kennedy – is as uh, pitching so much that I can actually see the screws coming out of the water. Wow. And at that point I have not that many, you know, about a minute or so, I don't know, I guess a little bit more time before I have to go turn and land on this thing. So I just remember thinking, this is why did I sign up for this job? You know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so um I ended up turning final, <clears throat> pitching deck. The LSOs are out there with Mobilis, the manually operated meatball basically, and they talk me down there is a screaming power call followed by wave off, wave off, and I still land. And, um, yeah, I got real close to the back of the boat that day. So as in, as in unforgivingly hitting the back of the boat. So once I got over the shock, if you will, and, and I realized that I was okay and we shut down, you know, taxied out of the LA shut down. First thing I did, which I shouldn't have, well, after I debriefed is I called my parents on the satellite phone. So I'm now about two months into a six-month cruise, about a third of the way through. And, and I am excited because I just escaped death, you know, so to speak. What I didn't take into perspective was my parents' perspective, I guess, or view of how they're going to take this. I said, hey, guys, hey, it's great. You know, hey, I just want to chat with you real quickly. Hey, I uh, almost ran into the back of the boat today. <laughs> not the <laughs> right thing to say. do. <laughs> yeah, not the right thing to say to your mother when no, you're absolutely not. No, yeah. thousands of miles away and you still got four more months of cruise. So not so good. But um, those are kind of the, the scary ones. And then can I give you one quick funny one? Absolutely. Go for it, Sunshine. Okay. So we blast off from the carrier. And this is sorry for those that have heard the Fighter Pilot podcast recount. But there's basically a urine bag that's going to float. So if you can picture the S3 cockpit. It's kind of got a, a roundish canopy bubble, as you could imagine. I'm in the left. The co-pilot's in the right-hand seat. Uh, he, We have long missions, and there's no bathroom in the back. So our solution is a giant Ziploc bag right, with a desiccant in the bottom. So I kind of look away while he's doing his thing, and then he stuffs it into a map case. So he seals the bag. He thinks. He thinks he seals the bag, sticks it in the map case, and off we go. Well, we just happened to have some practice bombs aboard that day. So we did our normal tanking mission, and we had some extra time, and we had these bombs on our wing. They're just smaller Mark 76s, little blue 25-pound things. 
So we started doing dive deliveries, and we had a couple left, and I said, hey, why don't we pickle, as in release the bomb, and being very safe, why don't we actually follow the bomb down to impact? And we'll recover before, but we'll follow it down. So we pickle the bomb, and it falls off the right-hand side of the wing, of the aircraft, excuse me. I roll, I visually acquire the bomb as it's fallen, and then I stuff the nose. When I stuff the nose to get a dive going, it's a pretty violent stuff. A lot of things come up out of the cockpit. Oh, one, of, <laughs> yep, one of which is the unsealed urine bag <laughs> over on the right-hand side of the aircraft. Now, keep in mind, remember that canopy that I talked yeah, about? Yeah. So this, this bag is going to open partially, and it's going to follow the curvature of the canopy. Now, it, all of a sudden, it comes into my field of regard, all my field of view, excuse me. I see the bomb. I see the water. I see my buddy. And then I see his urine bag kind of floating through the air. Oh. Dude. Yeah, and uh, this is the first time I've ever seen what I would call weightless, and even it's more free fall, I guess, free fall water bubbles. So basically the urine, some of it comes out, and it's those little globs kind of floating through the cockpit. <laughs> so now my, my attention is focused on these globs of urine, where they're going to go. Now I refocus on the bomb, and I see the water, and I'm like, oh, I need to recover. I need to pull up on the stick because we're getting close to the ground, or water, excuse me. So as I recover, I'm looking at the, the, the urine blobs, if you will, and they come and they basically splash down on my leg. So, and oh. we still had another two hours of mission time. So basically I had to fly around in my buddy's uh, urine. Well, I think that's while. the one time I'm not envious of you, uh, Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good idea. Yeah, I agree, totally agree. <laughs>